Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, we bring you a tale of negative gravity by Frank Stockton. It is the story of an inventor and his invention and its impact on his life. The invention is designed to lighten the load. His invention is designed to lighten a person's burdens, something I think we could all use right now. Stockton likes a good moral, as in The Lady or the Tiger, and this story does not disappoint. It is humorous and fun, something light for the beginning of summer. And now, A Tale of Negative Gravity by Frank Stockton. My wife and I were staying at a small town in northern Italy, and on a certain pleasant afternoon in spring, we had taken a walk of six or seven miles to see the sunset behind some low mountains to the west of the town. Most of our walk had been along a hard, smooth highway, and then we turned into a series of narrower roads, sometimes bordered by walls and sometimes by light fences of reed or cane. Nearing the mountain, to a low spur of which we intended to ascend, we easily scaled a wall about four feet high and found ourselves upon pasture land, which led sometimes by gradual ascents and sometimes by bits of rough climbing to the spot we wished to reach. We were afraid we were a little late and therefore hurried on, running up the grassy hills and bounding briskly over the rough and rocky places. I carried a knapsack strapped firmly to my shoulders and under my wife's arm was a large, soft basket of a kind much used by tourists. Her arm was passed through the handles and around the bottom of the basket, which she pressed closely to her side. This was the way she always carried it. The basket contained two bottles of wine, one sweet for my wife, and another a little acid for myself. Sweet wines give me a headache. When we reached the grassy bluff, well known thereabouts to lovers of sunset views, I stepped immediately to the edge to gaze upon the scene, but my wife sat down to take a sip of wine, for she was very thirsty. And then, leaving her basket, she came to my side. The scene was indeed one of great beauty. Beneath us stretched a wide valley of many shades of green, with a little river running through it, and red-tiled houses here and there. Beyond rose a range of mountains, pink, pale green, and purple where their tips caught the reflection of the setting sun, and of a rich gray-green in shadow. Beyond all was the blue Italian sky, illuminated in an especially fine sunset. My wife and I are Americans, and at the time of this story we were middle-aged people and very fond of seeing, in each other's company, whatever there was of interest or beauty around us. We had a son, about twenty-two years old, of whom we were also very fond, but he was not with us, being at the time a student in Germany. Although we had good health, we were not very robust people, and, under ordinary circumstances, not much given to long country tramps. I was of medium size, without much muscular development, while my wife was quite stout, and growing stouter. The reader may perhaps be somewhat surprised that a middle-aged couple, not very strong or very good walkers, the lady loaded down with a basket containing two bottles of wine and a metal drinking cup, and the gentleman carrying a heavy knapsack filled with all sorts of odds and ends strapped to his shoulders, should set off on a seven-mile walk, jump over a wall, run up a hillside, and yet feel in very good trim to enjoy a sunset view. This peculiar state of things, I will proceed to explain. I had been a professional man, but some years before had retired upon a very comfortable income. I had always been very fond of scientific pursuits, and now made these the occupation and pleasure of much of my leisure time. Our home was in a small town, and in a corner of my grounds I built a laboratory where I carried on my work and my experiments— I had long been anxious to discover the means not only of producing, but of retaining and controlling a natural force, really the same as centrifugal force, 
but which I called negative gravity. This name I adopted because it indicated better than any other the action of the force in question as I produced it. Positive gravity attracts everything toward the center of the earth. Negative gravity, therefore, would be that power which repels everything from the center of the earth, just as the negative pole of a magnet repels the needle while the positive pole attracts it. My object was, in fact, to store centrifugal force and to render it constant, controllable, and available for use. The advantages of such a discovery could scarcely be described. In a word, it would lighten the burdens of the world. I will not touch upon the labors and disappointments of several years. It is enough to say that at last I discovered a method of producing, storing, and controlling negative gravity. The mechanism of my invention was rather complicated, but the method of operating it was very simple. A strong metallic case, about eight inches long and half as wide, contained the machinery for producing the force, and this was put into action by means of the pressure of a screw worked from the outside. As soon as this pressure was produced, negative gravity began to be evolved and stored, and the greater the pressure, the greater the force. As the screw was moved outward, the pressure diminished, the force decreased, and when the screw was withdrawn to its fullest extent, the action of negative gravity entirely ceased. Thus, this force could be produced or dissipated at will to such degree as might be desired, and its action, so long as the requisite pressure was maintained, was constant. When this little apparatus worked to my satisfaction, I called my wife into my laboratory and explained to her my invention and its value. She had known that I had been at work with an important object, but I had never told her what it was. I had said that if I succeeded, I would tell her all, but if I failed, she need not be troubled with the matter at all. Being a very sensible woman, this satisfied her perfectly. Now I explained everything to her, the construction of the machine and the wonderful uses to which the invention could be applied. I told her that it could diminish or entirely dissipate the weight of objects of any kind. A heavily loaded wagon with two of these instruments fastened to its sides and each screwed to a proper force would be so lifted and supported that it would press upon the ground as lightly as an empty cart and a small horse could draw it with ease." A bale of cotton with one of these machines attached could be handled and carried by a boy. A car with a number of these machines could be made to rise in the air like a balloon. Everything, in fact, that was heavy could be made light. And, as a great part of labor all over the world is caused by the attraction of gravitation, so this repellent force, wherever applied, would make weight less and work easier. I told her of many, many ways in which the invention might be used, and would have told her many more, if she had not suddenly burst into tears. "'The world has gained something wonderful,' she exclaimed between her sobs. "'But I have lost a husband.' "'What do you mean by that?' I asked in surprise. "'I haven't minded it so far,' she said." "'because it gave you something to do, and it pleased you, "'and it never interfered with our home pleasures and our home life. "'But now that is all over. "'You will never be your own master again. "'It will succeed, I am sure, and you may make a great deal of money. "'But we don't need money. "'What we need is the happiness which we have always had, until now. "'Now there will be companies and patents and lawsuits and experiments "'and people calling you a humbug "'and other people saying they discovered it long ago "'and all sorts of persons coming to see you "'and you'll be obliged to go to all sorts of places "'and you will be an altered man "'and we shall never be happy again. "'Millions of money will not repay us for the happiness we have lost.'" These words of my wife struck me with much force. Before I had called her, my mind had begun to be filled and perplexed with ideas of what I ought to do now, that the great invention was perfected. Until now the matter had not troubled me at all. Sometimes I had gone backward and sometimes forward, but on the whole I had always felt encouraged. 
I had taken great pleasure in the work, but I had never allowed myself to be too much absorbed by it. But now everything was different. I began to feel that it was due to myself and to my fellow beings that I should properly put this invention before the world. And how should I set about it? What steps should I take? I must make no mistakes. When the matter should become known, hundreds of scientific people might set themselves to work. How could I tell but they might discover other methods of producing the same effect? I must guard myself against a great many things. I must get patents in all parts of the world. Already, as I have said, my mind began to be troubled and perplexed by these things. A turmoil of this sort did not suit my age or disposition. I could not but agree with my wife that the joys of a quiet and contented life were now about to be broken into. My dear, said I, I believe with you that the thing will do us more harm than good. If it were not for depriving the world of the invention, I would throw the whole thing to the winds. And yet, I added regretfully, I had expected a great deal of personal gratification from the use of this invention. Now listen, said my wife eagerly. Don't you think it would be best to do this? Use the thing as much as you please for your own amusement and satisfaction. But let the world wait. It has waited a long time, and let it wait a little longer. When we are dead, let Herbert have the invention. He will then be old enough to judge for himself whether it will be better to take advantage of it for his own profit or simply to give it to the public for nothing. It would be cheating him if we were to do the latter, but it would also be doing him a great wrong if we were, at his age, to load him with such a heavy responsibility. Besides, if he took it up, you could not help going into it, too. I took my wife's advice. I wrote a careful and complete account of the invention, and sealing it up, I gave it to my lawyers to be handed off to my son after my death. If he died first, I would make other arrangements. Then I determined to get all the good and fun out of the thing that was possible without telling anyone anything about it. Even Herbert, who was away from home, was not to be told of the invention. The first thing I did was to buy a strong leather knapsack, and inside of this I fastened my little machine, with a screw so arranged that it could be worked from the outside. Strapping this firmly to my shoulders, my wife gently turned the screw at the back until the upward tendency of the knapsack began to lift and sustain me, when I felt myself so gently supported and upheld that I seemed to weigh about thirty or forty pounds, I would set out for a walk. The knapsack did not rise me from the ground, but it gave me a very buoyant step. It was no labor at all to walk. It was a delight, an ecstasy. With the strength of a man and the weight of a child, I gaily strode along. The first day I walked half a dozen miles at a very brisk pace and came back without feeling in the least degree tired. These walks now became one of the greatest joys of my life. When nobody was looking, I would bound over a fence, sometimes just touching it with one hand, and sometimes not touching it at all. I delighted in rough places. I sprang over streams. I jumped and I ran. I felt like Mercury himself. I now set about making another machine so that my wife could accompany me in my walks. But when it was finished, she positively refused to use it. I can't wear a knapsack, she said. And there is no other good way of fastening it to me. Besides, everybody here knows I'm no walker, and it would only set them talking. I occasionally made use of this second machine, but I will give you only one instance of its application. Some repairs were needed to the foundation walls of my barn, and a two-horse wagon loaded with building stone had been brought into my yard and left there. In the evening, when the men had gone away... I took two of my machines and fastened them with strong chains, one on each side of the loaded wagon. Then, gradually turning the screws, the wagon was so lifted that its weight became very greatly diminished. We had an old donkey, which used to belong to Herbert, and which was now occasionally used with a small cart to bring packages from the station. I went into the barn and put the harness on the little fellow, and bringing him out to the wagon... 
I attached him to it. In this position he looked very funny, with the long pole sticking out in front of him and the great wagon behind. When all was ready, I touched him up, and to my great delight he moved off with the two-horse load of stone as easily as if he were drawing his own cart. I led him out into the public road, along which he proceeded without difficulty. He was an opinionated little beast and sometimes stopped, not liking the peculiar manner in which he was harnessed. But a touch of the switch made him move on, and I soon turned him and brought the wagon back into the yard. This determined the success of my invention in one of its most important uses, and with a satisfied heart I put the donkey into the stable and went into the house. Our trip to Europe was made a few months after this, and was mainly on our son Herbert's account. He, poor fellow, was in great trouble, and so therefore were we. He had become engaged, with our full consent, to a young lady in our town, the daughter of a gentleman whom we esteemed very highly. Herbert was young to be engaged to be married, but as we felt that he would never find a girl to make him so good a wife, we were entirely satisfied— especially as it was agreed on all hands that the marriage was not to take place for some time. It seemed to us that in marrying Janet Gilbert, Herbert would secure for himself in the very beginning of his career the most important element of a happy life. But suddenly, without any reason that seemed to us justifiable, Mr. Gilbert, the only surviving parent of Janet, broke off the match— and he and his daughter soon left the town for a trip to the west. This blow nearly broke poor Herbert's heart. He gave up his professional studies and came home to us, and for a time we thought he would be seriously ill. Then we took him to Europe, and after a continental tour of a month or two, we left him, at his own request, in Gottingen, where he thought it would do him good to go to work again. Then we went down to the little town in Italy— where my story first finds us. My wife had suffered much in mind and body on her son's account, and for this reason I was anxious that she should take outdoor exercise and enjoy as much as possible the bracing air of the country. I had brought with me both my little machines. One was still in my knapsack, and the other I had fastened to the inside of an enormous family trunk— as one is obliged to pay for nearly every pound of his baggage on the continent, this saved me a great deal of money. Everything heavy was packed into this great trunk. Books, papers, the bronze, iron, and marble relics we had picked up, and all the articles that usually weigh down a tourist's baggage. I screwed up the negative gravity apparatus until the trunk could be handled with great ease by an ordinary porter. I could have made it weigh nothing at all— but this, of course, I did not wish to do. The lightness of my baggage, however, had occasioned some comment, and I had overheard remarks which were not altogether complimentary about people travelling around with empty trunks. But this only amused me. Desirous that my wife should have the advantage of negative gravity while taking our walks, I had removed the machine from the trunk and fastened it inside the basket, which she could carry under her arm. This assisted her wonderfully. When one arm was tired, she put the basket under the other, and thus, with one hand on my arm, she could easily keep up with the free and buoyant steps my knapsack enabled me to take. She did not object to long tramps here, because nobody knew that she was not a walker, and she always carried some wine or other refreshment in the basket, not only because it was pleasant to have it with us, but because it seemed ridiculous to go about carrying an empty basket— there were English-speaking people stopping at the hotel where we were, but they seemed more fond of driving than walking, and none of them offered to accompany us on our rambles, for which we were very glad. There was one man there, however, who was a great walker. He was an Englishman, a member of an alpine club, and generally went about dressed in a knickerbocker suit, with grey woolen stockings covering an enormous pair of calves. One evening... This gentleman was talking to me and some others about the ascent of the Matterhorn, and I took occasion to deliver in pretty strong language my opinion on such exploits. I declared them to be useless, foolhardy, and if the climber had any one who loved him, wicked. Even if the weather should permit a view, I said, what is that compared to the terrible risk to life? 
Under certain circumstances, I added, thinking of a kind of waistcoat I had had some idea of making, which set about with little negative gravity machines all connected with a conveniently handled screw would enable the wearer at times to dispense with his weight altogether. Such a sense might be divested of danger and be quite admissible, but ordinarily they should be frowned upon by the intelligent public. The alpine man looked at me, especially regarding my somewhat slight figure and thinnish legs. It is all very well of you to talk that way, he said, because it is easy to see that you are not up to that sort of thing. In conversations of this kind, I replied, I never make personal allusions, but since you have chosen to do so, I feel inclined to invite you to walk with me tomorrow to the top of the mountain to the north of this town. I'll do it, he said, at any time you choose to name. And as I left the room soon afterward, I heard him laughing. The next afternoon, about two o'clock, the Alpine Club man and myself set out for the mountain. What have you got in your knapsack? he said. A hammer to use if I come across geological specimens, a field glass, a flask of wine, and some other things. Oh, I wouldn't carry any weight if I were you, he said. Oh, I don't mind it, I answered, and off we started. The mountain to which we were bound was about two miles from the town. Its nearest side was steep and in places almost precipitous, but it sloped away more gradually toward the north, and up that side a road led by devious windings to a village near the summit. It was not a very high mountain, but it would do for an afternoon's climb. I suppose you want to go up by the road, said my companion. Oh, no, I answered. We won't go so far around as that. There is a path up this side, along which I have seen men driving their goats. I prefer to take that. All right, if you say so, he answered with a smile. But you'll find it pretty tough. After a time, he remarked, I wouldn't walk so fast if I were you. Oh, I like to step along briskly, I said, and briskly on I went. My wife had screwed up the machine in the knapsack more than usual, and walking seemed scarcely an effort at all. I carried a long alpenstock, and when we reached the mountain and began to ascent, I found that with the help of this and my knapsack, I could go uphill at a wonderful rate. My companion had taken the lead so as to show me how to climb. Making a detour over some rocks, I quickly passed him and went ahead. After that, it was impossible for him to keep up with me. I ran up steep places, I cut off the windings of the path by slightly clambering over rocks, and when I followed the beaten track, my step was as rapid as if I had been walking on level ground. Look here, shouted the Alpine Club man from below. You'll kill yourself if you go at that rate. That's no way to climb the mountains. It's my way, I cried, and on I skipped. Twenty minutes after I arrived at the summit, my companion joined me, puffing and wiping his red face with his handkerchief. Confound it, he cried. I never came up a mountain so fast in my life. You need not have hurried, I said coolly. I was afraid something would happen to you, he growled, and I wanted to stop you. I never saw a person climb in such an utterly absurd way. I don't see why you should call it absurd. I said, smiling with an air of superiority. I arrived here in a perfectly comfortable condition, neither heated nor wearied. He made no answer, but walked off to a little distance, fanning himself with his hat and growling words which I did not catch. After a time, I proposed to descend. You must be careful as you go down, he said. It is much more dangerous to go down steep places than to climb up. I am always prudent, I answered, and started in advance. I found the descent of the mountain much more pleasant than the ascent. It was positively exhilarating. I jumped from rocks and bluffs eight and ten feet in height and touched the ground as gently as if I had stepped down but two feet. I ran down steep paths and, with the aid of my alpenstock, stopped myself in an instant. I was careful to avoid dangerous places, but the runs and jumps I made were such as no man had ever made before upon that mountainside. Once only I heard my companion's voice. You'll break your blank 
Neck! he yelled. Never fear, I called back, and soon left him far above. When I reached the bottom, I would have waited for him, but my activity had warmed me up, and as a cool evening breeze was beginning to blow, I thought it better not to stop and take cold. Half an hour after my arrival at the hotel, I came down to the court, cool, fresh, and dressed for dinner, and just in time to meet the alpine man as he entered hot, dusty, and growling. "'Excuse me for not waiting for you,' I said. But without stopping to hear my reason, he muttered something about waiting in a place where no one would care to stay, and passed into the house. There was no doubt that what I had done gratified my peak and tickled my vanity. "'I think now,' I said when I related the matter to my wife, "'that he will scarcely say that I am not up to that sort of thing.' "'I am not sure,' she answered, "'that it was exactly fair. "'He did not know how you were assisted.' "'It was fair enough,' I said. "'He is enabled to climb well by the inherited vigour of his constitution "'and by his training. "'He did not tell me what methods of exercise he used "'to get those great muscles upon his legs. "'I am enabled to climb by the exercise of my intellect.' My method is my business, and his method is his business. It is all perfectly fair. Still, she persisted. He thought that you climbed with your legs and not with your head. And now, after this long digression, necessary to explain how a middle-aged couple of slight pedestrian ability and loaded with a heavy knapsack and basket should have started out on a rough walk and climb, fourteen miles in all, We will return to ourselves standing on the little bluff and gazing out upon the sunset view. When the sky began to fade a little, we turned from it and prepared to go back to the town. Where is the basket? I said. I left it right here, answered my wife. I unscrewed the machine and it lay perfectly flat. Did you afterward take out the bottles? I asked, seeing them lying on the grass. "'Yes, I believe I did. "'I had to take out yours in order to get at mine.' "'Then,' said I, "'after looking all about the grassy patch on which we stood, "'I am afraid you did not entirely unscrew the instrument, "'and that when the weight of the bottles was removed, "'the basket gently rose into the air. "'It may be so,' she said lugubriously. "'The basket was behind me as I drank my wine.' "'I believe that is just what has happened,' I said. "'Look up there. I vow that is our basket.' I pulled out my field glass and directed it at the little speck high above our heads. It was the basket, floating high in the air. I gave the glass to my wife to look, but she did not want to use it. "'What shall I do?' she cried. "'I can't walk home without that basket. It's perfectly dreadful.' and she looked as if she was going to cry. "'Do not distress yourself,' I said, although I was a good deal disturbed myself. "'We shall get home very well. You shall put your hand on my shoulder while I put my arm around you. Then you can screw up my machine a good deal higher, and it will support us both. In this way I am sure that we shall get on very well.' We carried out this plan, and managed to walk on with moderate comfort— To be sure, with the knapsack pulling me upward and the weight of my wife pulling me down, the straps hurt me somewhat, which they had not done before. We did not spring lightly over the wall into the road, but still clinging to each other we clambered awkwardly over it. The road, for the most part, declined gently toward the town, and with moderate ease we made our way along it. But we walked much more slowly than we had done before, and it was quite dark when we reached our hotel." If it had not been for the light inside the court, it would have been difficult for us to find it. A traveling carriage was standing before the entrance and against the light. It was necessary to pass around it, and my wife went first. I attempted to follow her, but, strange to say, there was nothing under my feet. I stepped vigorously, but only wagged my legs in the air. To my horror, I found that I was rising in the air. I soon saw, by the light below me, that I was some fifteen feet from the ground. The carriage drove away, and in the darkness I was not noticed. Of course, 
I knew what had happened. The instrument in my knapsack had been screwed up to such an intensity in order to support both myself and my wife that when her weight was removed, the force of the negative gravity was sufficient to raise me from the ground. But I was glad to find that when I had risen to the height I have mentioned, I did not go up any higher, but hung in the air, about on a level with the second tier of windows of the hotel. I now began to try to reach the screw in my knapsack in order to reduce the force of the negative gravity. But do what I would, I could not get my hand to it. The machine in the knapsack had been placed so as to support me in a well-balanced and comfortable way, and in doing this it had been impossible to set the screw so that I could reach it. But in a temporary arrangement of the kind, this had not been considered necessary, as my wife always turned the screw for me until sufficient lifting power had been attained. I had intended, as I have said before, to construct a negative gravity waistcoat in which the screw should be in front and entirely under the wearer's control. But this was a thing of the future. When I found I could not turn the screw, I began to be much alarmed. Here I was, dangling in the air without any means of reaching the ground. I could not expect my wife to return to look for me, as she would naturally suppose I had stopped to speak to someone— I thought of loosening myself from the knapsack, but this would not do, for I should fall heavily and either kill myself or break some of my bones. I did not dare to call for assistance, for if any of the simple-minded inhabitants of the town had discovered me floating in the air, they would have taken me for a demon and would probably have shot at me. A moderate breeze was blowing, and it wafted me gently down the street. If it had blown me against a tree... I would have seized it, and have endeavoured, so to speak, to climb down it. But there were no trees. There was a dim street lamp here and there, but reflectors above them threw their light upon the pavement, and none up to me. On many accounts I was glad that the night was so dark, for much as I desired to get down, I wanted no one to see me in my strange position, which to anyone but myself and my wife would be utterly unaccountable. If I could rise as high as the roofs, I might get on one of them, and tearing off an armful of tiles, so load myself that I would be heavy enough to descend. But I did not rise to the eaves of any of the houses. If there had been a telegraph pole or anything of that kind, I would have clung to it. I would have taken off the knapsack, and would have endeavoured to scramble down as well as I could. But there was nothing I could cling to. Even the water spouts, if I could have reached the face of the houses, were embedded in the walls. At an open window, near which I was slowly blown, I saw two little boys going to bed by the light of a dim candle. I was dreadfully afraid that they would see me and raise an alarm. I actually came so near to the window that I threw out one foot and pushed against the wall with such force that I went nearly across the street. I thought I caught sight of a frightened look on the face of one of the boys, but of this I am not sure— and I heard no cries. I still floated, dangling down the street. What was to be done? Should I call out? In that case, if I were not shot or stoned, my strange predicament and the secret of my invention would be exposed to the world. If I did not do this, I must either let myself drop and be killed or mangled, or hang there and die." When, during the course of the night, the air became more rarefied, I might rise higher and higher, perhaps to an altitude of two hundred feet. It would then be impossible for people to reach me and get me down, even if they were convinced that I was not a demon. I should then expire. And when the birds of the air had eaten all of me they could devour, I should forever hang above the unlucky town, a dangling skeleton, with a knapsack on its back. Such thoughts were not reassuring, and I determined that if I could find no means of getting down without assistance, I would call out and run all risks. But so long as I could endure the tension of the straps, I would hold out and hope for a tree or a pole. Perhaps it might rain, and my wet clothes would then become so heavy that I would descend as low as the top of a lamp post. As this thought was passing through my mind, 
I saw a spark of a light upon the street approaching me. I rightly imagined that it came from a tobacco pipe, and presently I heard a voice. It was that of the Alpine Club man. Of all people in the world, I did not want to discover me, and I hung as motionless as possible. The man was speaking to another person who was walking with him. He is crazy beyond a doubt, said the Alpine man. Nobody but a maniac could have gone up and down that mountain as he did. He hasn't any muscles, and one need only look at him to know that he couldn't do any climbing in a natural way. It is only the excitement of insanity that gives him strength. The two now stopped almost under me, and the speaker continued. Such things are common with maniacs. At times they acquire an unnatural strength, which is perfectly wonderful. I have seen a little fellow struggle and fight so that four strong men could not hold him. Then the other person spoke. I am afraid what you say is too true, he remarked. Indeed, I have known it for some time. At these words, my breath almost stopped. It was the voice of Mr. Gilbert, my townsman and the father of Janet. It must have been he who arrived in the traveling carriage. He was acquainted with the Alpine Club man, and they were talking of me. Proper or improper, I listened with all my ears. It is a very sad case, Mr. Gilbert continued. My daughter was engaged to marry his son, but I broke off the match. I could not have her marry the son of a lunatic, and there could be no doubt of his condition. He has been seen, a man of his age and the head of his family, to load himself up with a heavy knapsack, which there is no earthly necessity for him to carry, and go skipping along the road for miles, vaulting over fences and jumping over rocks and ditches like a young calf or a colt. I myself saw a most heart-rendering instance of how a kindly man's nature can be changed by derangement of his intellect. I was at some distance from his house, but I plainly saw him harness a little donkey, which he owns, to a large two-horse wagon loaded with stone, and beat and lash the poor little beast until it drew the heavy load some distance along the public road. I would have remonstrated with him on this horrible cruelty, but he had the wagon back in his yard before I could reach him. Oh, there can be no doubt of his insanity, said the Alpine Club man, and he oughtn't to be allowed to travel about in this way. Some day he will pitch his wife over a precipice just for the fun of seeing her shoot through the air. I am sorry he is here, said Mr. Gilbert, for it would be very painful to meet him. My daughter and I will retire very soon and go away as early tomorrow morning as possible so as to avoid seeing him. And then they walked back to the hotel. For a few moments I hung, utterly forgetful of my condition and absorbed in the consideration of these revelations. One idea now filled my mind— Everything must be explained to Mr. Gilbert, even if it should be necessary to have him called to me and for me to speak to him from the upper air. Just then, I saw something white approaching me along the road. My eyes had become accustomed to the darkness, and I perceived that it was an upturned face. I recognized the hurried gait, the form. It was my wife. As she came near me, I called her name and in the same breath entreated her not to scream— it must have been an effort for her to restrain herself, but she did it. "'You must help me to get down,' I said, without anybody seeing us. "'What shall I do?' she whispered. "'Try to catch hold of this string.' Taking a piece of twine from my pocket, I lowered one end to her, but it was too short. She could not reach it. I then tied my handkerchief to it, but it still was not long enough.' "'I can get more string or handkerchiefs,' she whispered hurriedly. "'No,' I said. "'You could not get them up to me. "'But leaning against the hotel wall on this side in the corner, "'just inside of the garden gate, are some fishing poles. "'I have seen them there every day. "'You can easily find them in the dark. "'Go, please, and bring one of those.' "'The hotel was not far away, "'and in a few moments my wife returned with a fishing pole.' She stood on tiptoe and reached it high in the air, but all she could do was to strike my feet and legs with it. 
My most frantic exertions did not enable me to get my hands low enough to touch it. Wait a minute, she said, and the rod was withdrawn. I knew what she was doing. There was a hook and line attached to the pole, and with womanly dexterity she was fastening the hook to the extreme end of the rod. Soon she reached up and gently struck at my legs. After a few attempts, the hook caught in my trousers, a little below my right knee. Then there was a slight pull, a long scratching sound down my leg, and the hook was stopped by the top of my boot. Then came a steady downward pull, and I felt myself descending. Gently and firmly the rod was drawn down. Carefully the lower end was kept free from the ground, and in a few moments my ankle was seized with a vigorous grasp. Then someone seemed to be climbing up me. My feet touched the ground. An arm was thrown around my neck. The hand of another arm was busy at the backpack of my knapsack, and I soon stood firmly in the road, entirely divested of negative gravity. "'Oh, that I should have forgotten,' sobbed my wife, "'and that I should have dropped your arms and let you go up in the air. At first I thought you had stopped below, and it was only a little while ago that the truth flashed upon me. Then I rushed out and began looking up for you. I knew that you had wax matches in your pocket, and hoped that you would keep on striking them so that you would be seen.' "'But I did not wish to be seen,' I said, as we hurried to the hotel. "'And I can never be sufficiently thankful that it was you who found me and brought me down. "'Do you know that it was Mr. Gilbert and his daughter who have just arrived? "'I must see him instantly. I will explain it all to you when I come upstairs.' "'I took off my knapsack and gave it to my wife, who carried it to our room, "'while I went to look for Mr. Gilbert. "'Fortunately, I found him just as he was about to go up to his chamber.' He took my offered hand, but looked at me sadly and gravely. "'Mr. Gilbert,' I said, "'I must speak to you in private. Let us step into this room. There is no one here.' "'My friend,' said Mr. Gilbert, "'it will be much better to avoid discussing this subject. It is very painful to us both, and no good can come from talking of it. You cannot comprehend what it is I want to say to you.' I replied. Come in here, and in a few minutes you will be glad that you listened to me. My manner was so earnest and impressive that Mr. Gilbert was constrained to follow me, and we went into a small room called the smoking room, but in which people seldom smoked, and closed the door. I immediately began my statement. I told my old friend that I had discovered by means that I need not explain at present that he had considered me crazy, and that now the most important object of my life was to set myself right in his eyes. I thereupon gave him the whole history of my invention, and explained the reason of the actions that had appeared to him those of a lunatic. I said nothing about the little incident of that evening. That was a mere accident, and I did not care now to speak of it. Mr. Gilbert listened to me very attentively. "'Your wife is here?' he asked when I had finished. "'Yes,' I said, "'and she will corroborate my story in every item, "'and no one could ever suspect her of being crazy. "'I will go and bring her to you.' "'In a few minutes my wife was in the room, "'had shaken hands with Mr. Gilbert, "'and had been told of my suspected madness. "'She turned pale, but smiled. "'He did act like a crazy man,' she said. "'but I never supposed that anybody would think him one.' "'And tears came into her eyes. "'And now, my dear,' said I, "'perhaps you will tell Mr. Gilbert how I did all of this.' "'And then she told him the story that I had told. "'Mr. Gilbert looked from one to the other of us with a troubled air. "'Of course I do not doubt either of you, "'or rather I do not doubt that you believe what you say.' All would be right if I could bring myself to credit that such a force as that you speak of can possibly exist. That is a matter, said I, which I can easily prove to you by actual demonstration. If you can wait a short time until my wife and I have had something to eat, for I am nearly famished, and I am sure she must be, I will set your mind at rest upon that point. I will wait here, said Mr. Gilbert, and smoke a cigar. 
Don't hurry yourselves. I shall be glad to have some time to think about what you have told me. When we finished the dinner which had been set aside for us, I went upstairs and got my knapsack, and we both joined Mr. Gilbert in the smoking room. I showed him the little machine and explained very briefly the principle of its construction. I did not give any practical demonstration of its action, because there were people walking about the corridor who might at any moment come into the room. But looking out of the window, I saw that the night was much clearer. The wind had dissipated the clouds, and the stars were shining brightly. "'If you want to come up the street with me,' said I to Mr. Gilbert, "'I will show you how this thing works.' "'That is just what I want to see,' he answered. "'I will go with you,' said my wife, throwing a shawl over her head, and we started up the street. When we were outside the little town, I found the starlight was quite sufficient for my purpose. The white roadway, the low walls, and the objects about us could easily be distinguished. "'Now,' I said to Mr. Gilbert, "'I want to put this knapsack on you and let you see how it feels, and how it will help you to walk.' To this he assented, with some eagerness, and I strapped it firmly on him. "'I will now turn this screw,' said I, "'until you shall become lighter and lighter. "'Be very careful not to turn it too much,' said my wife earnestly. "'Oh, you can depend on me for that,' said I, turning the screw very gradually. "'Mr. Gilbert was a stout man, and I was obliged to give the screw a good many turns. "'There seems to be considerable hoist in it,' he said directly. "'And then I put my arm around him, and found that I could raise him from the ground. "'Are you lifting me?' he exclaimed in surprise. "'Yes, I did it with ease,' I answered. "'Upon my word!' ejaculated Mr. Gilbert. "'I then gave the screw a half-turn more "'and told him to walk and run. "'He started off, at first slowly, "'then made long strides. "'Then he began to run, and then to skip and jump. "'It had been many years since Mr. Gilbert had skipped and jumped. "'No one was in sight, and he was free to gamble as much as he pleased. "'Can you give it another turn?' he said, bounding up to me. "'I want to try that wall.' "'I put on a little more negative gravity, "'and he vaulted over a five-foot wall with great ease.' In an instant he had leaped back onto the road, and in two bounds was at my side. "'I came down light as a cat,' he said. "'There was never anything like it.' And away he went up the road, taking steps at least eight feet long, leaving my wife and me laughing heartily at the preternatural agility of our stout friend. In a few minutes he was with us again. "'Take it off,' he said. "'If I wear it any longer I shall want one myself.' and then I shall be taken for a crazy man, and perhaps clapped into an asylum. Now, said I, as I turned back the screw before unstrapping the knapsack, do you understand how I took long walks, and leaped and jumped, and how I ran uphill and downhill, and how the little donkey drew the loaded wagon? I understand it all, cried he. I take back all I ever said about you, my friend. And... "'Herbert may marry Janet?' cried my wife. "'May marry her?' cried Mr. Gilbert. "'Indeed, he shall marry her, if I have anything to say about it. "'My poor girl has been drooping ever since I told her it could not be.' "'My wife rushed at him, but whether she embraced him or only shook his hands, "'I cannot say, for I had the knapsack in one hand and was rubbing my eyes with the other. "'But, my dear fellow,' said Mr. Gilbert directly. If you still consider it your interest to keep your invention a secret, I wish you had never made it. No one having a machine like that can help using it, and it is often quite as bad to be considered a maniac as to be one. My friend, I cried with some excitement, I have made up my mind on this subject. The little machine in this knapsack, which is the only one I now possess, has been a great pleasure to me, but I now know it has also been of the greatest injury indirectly to me and mine, not to mention some direct inconvenience and danger, which I will speak of another time. 
The secret lies with us three, and we will keep it. But the invention itself is too full of temptation and danger for any of us. As I said this, I held the knapsack with one hand, while I quickly turned the screw with the other. In a few moments, it was high above my head, while I with difficulty held it down by the straps. Look, I cried, and then I released my hold, and the knapsack shot into the air and disappeared into the upper gloom. I was about to make a remark, but had no chance, for my wife threw herself upon my bosom, sobbing with joy. Oh, I am so glad, so glad, she said. And you will never make another? Never another, I answered. And now let us hurry in and see Janet, said my wife. You don't know how heavy and clumsy I feel, said Mr. Gilbert, striving to keep up with us as we walked back. If I had worn that thing much longer, I should never have been willing to take it off. Janet had retired, but my wife went up to her room. I think she felt it as much as our boy, she said when she rejoined me. But I tell you, my dear, I left a very happy girl in that little bedchamber over the garden. And there were three very happy elderly people talking together until quite late that evening. I shall write to Herbert tonight, I said when we separated and tell him to meet us in Geneva. It will do the young man no harm if we interrupt his studies just now. You must let me add a postscript to the letter, said Mr. Gilbert, and I am sure it will require no knapsack with a screw in the back to bring him quickly to us. And it did not. There is a wonderful pleasure in tripping over the earth like a winged mercury, and in feeling one's self relieved of much of that attraction of gravitation, which drags us down to earth and gradually makes the movement of our bodies but weariness and labor. But this pleasure is not to be compared, I think, to that given by the buoyancy and lightness of two young and loving hearts reunited after a separation which they had supposed would last forever. What became of the basket and the knapsack, or whether they ever met in upper air, I do not know, if they but float away and stay away from ken of mortal man, I shall be satisfied. And whether or not the world will ever know more of the power of negative gravity depends entirely upon the disposition of my son Herbert, when, after a good many years, I hope, he shall open the packet my lawyers have in keeping. Note, it would be quite useless for anyone to interview my wife on this subject— for she has entirely forgotten how my machine was made. And as for Mr. Gilbert, he never knew. And that's our story for this evening. I hope you enjoyed A Tale of Negative Gravity by Frank Stockton. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.